Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Tonight will be our first Ask Anything program in a while. You're welcome to call in about, well, <laughs> anything. But we may try to focus a bit on infectious diseases and neurology, according to our experts, but they're both internists. Okay, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. In 2013, worldwide, an estimated 500,000 people died of malaria, mostly children on the African continent. The question, true or false, there are 1,500 cases of malaria diagnosed in the United States each year. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of The Picture of Health. This book was written by me with wonderful accompanying photographs by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in, but we'll answer any of your questions, and we need your questions as they're called in. So please give us your call. Send in it via Facebook or email, or call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225, or send us that email. Tonight, I have the great pleasure to welcome back someone I've known for many years who's been an inspiration for me through my career. Joining us tonight is Dr. Ken Walker, neurologist, great educator, my mentor, uh, who brought along infectious disease specialist, Dr. Archel Undelasvili, both from the Emory Medical Center in Atlanta. Ken, welcome back. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, uh, you were the internal medicine residency director and, uh, and the guy who hired me when I was on the faculty for three years. Uh, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that wonderful three years experience as being on the faculty at Emory. Have I ever thanked you enough on that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll buy you a glass of wine later or something. But tell us uh, a little bit about where you're from, what, what uh, happened. You're from a, a farm in, in Georgia, right? I <clears throat> grew up on a tiny little 109-acre farm, uh, probably not unlike a fair number of farms out here in South Dakota. Chicken, cotton, cows, peanuts, horses, etc. Had to get up at 4 a.m. every morning and go out and milk 10 cows, and then at 7 o'clock catch a school bus. And so when I was 16, I went away to Emory to high school, and I've stayed there ever since, except for two years of in Vietnam as a physician in the military. And I became <clears throat> the program director, and the <clears throat> at Emory University hospital at Emory University program director in internal medicine for 30 years. I was head of medical education for the Department of Medicine for 30 years. I ran the uh, service, the medical service at Grady Hospital, which is one of the huge inner city hospitals in the world uh, for 30 years. And so basically, that's my background. Yes. And I remember so well, I think you went to medical school the first two years in South Dakota. Yeah. And then you came to us as a junior, and I remember having been told by the dean to be on the lookout for this guy from South Dakota, that we're not sure whether he's good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> and it was my pleasure to discover that you were excellent, and we kept you on the faculty, and it was our great pleasure to do so. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, as a neurologist, were you a neurologist when you were uh, in the combat units, the, the sort of the MASH units at, uh, in Vietnam? No, I was in, in internal medicine, then I came back and then became a neurologist. Wow. So, uh, and you, somewhere along the line, um, uh, Achico, that's a nickname for Archel, right? Or yes. Achico is sort of like Archie? Uh, no, Achico is a nickname for Archil. That, I will just leave it at that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, how did the two of you meet, Achiko? Well, I met Dr. Walker when I worked in the infectious disease hospital uh, in my country, where I'm originally from, in Georgia. Uh, I would host the students from Emory University, which we had every summer 
for their summer elective research projects. And usually those students would be working uh, with me. I would coordinate their activities and uh, help with their research. And uh, then as a head of the program for Emory site, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Walker. And then I got involved with some other international projects that he led, especially in my country. and. Uh, that's how we started working together. Now we run a wide variety of international programs. Okay. One of them is New Medical School in Tbilisi, Georgia. Right. I mean, they had a medical school there, but you've, Emory decided to, with your guidance to, to start a new medical school. Uh, there's a very long tradition of medical education in Georgia. In fact, the uh, State Medical University that we work uh, with right now, with the help of Emory University School of Medicine, uh, is 80, year old, 80 years old. It's a traditional, it's a long tradition, as I mentioned, in Georgia. Uh, but with the leadership of the university and with the assistance from the Emory University, we have decided that it was time to try uh, different new approach, modern appro approach to medical education, and we established a new six-year medical curriculum based on Emory School of Medicine curriculum. And it's an international program that is on its third admission now, and we have students from 11 dif different countries around oh, the world. Oh, so it's an international school. It's an international uh, English language program, and program is based on USMLE education. Wow. So. But if you graduate from the, that school to come to the South, to come to the U.S., come to South Dakota, come to any state in our U.S., you need to do a residency here. Then. Uh, yes, it's uh, exactly same as uh, graduating from any other uh, ECFMG accredited university around the world, including uh, United States. Uh, you have to take USMLE exams, right. um, interview, match the program to the residency, and uh, our program is uh, accredited and there's a long tradition of Georgian uh, graduates coming to U.S. for their residence training. How about residency training there? Because there is a pressure on our residencies here about uh, getting in. There seems to be more, they've pushed the medical schools to have more med students and there aren't enough residency programs, and so the question is, uh, are there also residency programs over there that you can? Yes, there's a residence. Pro uh, there certainly are residency programs in Georgia as well. Uh, just like in the United States, uh, states there are uh, also uh, there are also limited spots available uh, because there are only so many doctors uh, that the country needs. Uh, what we are working right now is working towards improving the clinical education as well to um, maybe not improving but uh, arranging it the way that it, the clinical education will also match the western style medical education and uh, that comes as a preclinical in the uh, medical school. Uh, there is a trend that uh, it's getting harder and harder for foreign graduates to uh, find the spots in the U.S. residency programs, but that is our goal is not to send the um, students necessarily to U.S. Our goal is uh, simply to prepare uh, ready for tomorrow physicians. Right. In this changing world, we think that curriculums need to be updated and changed as the medicine develops. Yeah. So that's what we are doing in yeah, And you have a, you're probably more mobile to do that in this new school. I bet you can really be creative in, in doing just that. So this, we've got just a little bit more before the break. Let, uh, I'm going to ask about the, the new virus that's causing neurologic problems. Uh, actually, we're going to do that after this story. Uh, so let's go right into this, and then we'll We'll, um, we'll be back. Of, of all the supplements that people take, one stands out as being promoted by the best science, vitamin D. In fact, vitamin D is the only supplement that NASA gives its astronauts. One of the concerns we have for astronauts during spaceflight is vitamin D. Um, when your spacecraft are shielded against ultraviolet light, 
Um, the spacecraft food system doesn't have as many sources of vitamin D as we might like, um, and therefore vitamin D becomes an issue. And vitamin D is the only vitamin that we provide to the crew members as a supplement. And one of the ways that we helped to figure out how much vitamin D people needed was by doing studies in the Antarctic, which we use as an analog for space flight. Wintering over in the Antarctic for six months, the sun doesn't come up, a little bit like South Dakota. You know, it's a very constrained environment, it's a very remote environment with no ultraviolet light. It becomes a very good analog for space station crew members. And we did studies looking at different doses of vitamin D and how much vitamin D it would take to maintain vitamin D levels at a good, at a good level during the winter in Antarctica, which then translated to space station. We provide 800 international units of vitamin D for the astronauts each day. Uh, again, in supplement forms. So they get a little bit from their diet, um, and the 800 IUs we've actually documented maintains their vitamin D levels at a, at a very good level. Um, that's a little bit higher than the RDA. Um, the RDA for people 1 to 70 is 600 IUs. Um, for people over 70, it's 800 IUs. And the difference there is that there's an assumption that people in that 1 to 70 category will get some sunlight exposure. So we're right in par with where the RDAs are and have data from crew members on six-month space station missions that document that that level of intake does work to keep levels at a, good, at a good pace. The studies we did in Antarctica, we looked at several doses, and we did some double-blind studies and looked at responses based on intake and the course of the winter. In the one study we did, we looked at 1,000 IUs and 2,000 IUs and found no difference. Um, so we think the body adapts at a certain point that, you know, 800 we think is good, um, 1,000 is probably no different, and really 2,000 is no different. So it's one of those cases where you need to get enough, but getting more won't help you anymore. Well, vitamin D is, is tied in with calcium metabolism and tied in with bone health, which are key concerns for space flight. Um, astronauts lose bone during flight. Their kidney stone risk is very high because as you're losing bone, the calcium that comes out of those bone ends up in your urine. Um, so we're very concerned, again, about kidney stone risk, bone loss. Um, vitamin D deficiency will exacerbate that. So the last thing we want is somebody to be vitamin D deficient during space flight. But I also need to say that that doesn't mean that taking vitamin D during space flight is going to prevent you from losing bone. But again, not having enough vitamin D would make it worse. So it's one of those cases where it's not the fix for everything, but you need to make sure that you've got good nutritional support on board um, to allow the rest of your physiology to, to, to maintain. Uh, you know, I've been an advocate for vitamin D uh, when after seeing a study that showed that low levels seem to run higher mortality, more, higher death rates, and higher levels seem to be some protection, although the data doesn't show that giving vitamin D in an oral supplement has made that much difference yet. So we're still in a, it's kind of in the, in the iffy phase, phase. Can you have a comment about that? Uh, I think that the data is still out, and there is clearly important information to have. Right, so we're, we're looking at answers, and let's get to the questions, though. A uh, 69-year-old man from Spirit Lake have the doctors discuss how to distinguish between having a bladder infection as a male and its possibility of spreading to the prostate. Any comment? Ken? Well, <clears throat> every time you see a male, who has uh, infected urine or white cells in the urine. The question always is, is this a bladder infection or is it from the prostate? And usually it's helpful to do a culture of the urine and secondly to do a digital rectal examination. And most of the time if it's from the prostate, the prostate will be enlarged and very, very painful. Right. I suspect as a general internist that you know a lot more than I do about that. Well, that, that's the answer. You put your finger on that prostate and if that's the problem, they'll tell you. But it's, it's a hard deal. You treat them either way. Uh, the other question, in a woman, another story, uh, you try not to treat because so many of them have a low-grade 
sort of a colonization. They have a bacteria in their urine. It doesn't cause a problem. And so you don't want to be aggressive in treating them. But men are another story because when they have an infection in their bladder, whether it's in the prostate or the bladder, uh, that, that can raise all sorts of uh, ruckus. So it's just different. It's a different story. Uh, uh, explain the Zika virus. Well, that brings us to this. The news has been full of stories about a virus that's been carried by mosquitoes. It's called the Zika virus. It's similar to the West Nile, but Zika is not carried by the types of mosquitoes we have in South Dakota. It is only carried by mosquitoes that live in the tropics, subtropics, southernmost U.S. states. Most adult, healthy adults would not even notice that they've had it as only one in five people show any symptoms. Fever, muscle, or eye pain, and a rash in uh, the two weeks after the, they're bitten is about what they get. Even then, most will be fine as their immune system fights the virus through the, although some might develop the French polio or Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, where the immune system attacks the nervous system. But a larger problem comes when women who are pregnant, when or become pregnant shortly after they're infected. These women have been shown to give a birth to children who have smaller brains, smaller heads, microencephaly, as they say. It's a birth defect where a baby's head is smaller than expected than compared to babies of the same age. So uh, with that, it's been quite devastating. Ken, you have any comments about this? It obviously has the potential of being a huge public health issue. And the, U the World Health Organization and the U.S. Public Health Service and the CDC are obviously very much laying plans as to how to tackle it. Uh, a fortunate thing, of course, from the standpoint of the U.S. is that it's wintertime in the U.S. and the mosquitoes that carry it, mostly Aedes aegypti, are not out and about. Uh, they will be out and about beginning in the late spring, where it will be mostly in Florida and the Gulf Coast. But they're not out and about in Florida at this time? No. And so it's, the cases in the U.S. so far, as I understand it, have come from people who have visited endemic areas in South America and have come back to the U.S. So the message the CDC is saying is that what? is that we're going to take care of this, just wait and let's see what our plans are. Right. And not to worry about it at the time being here in the U.S. If you're traveling. And if you're traveling, it's another matter. You need to find out ahead of time if the places you're going have the Zika virus. If they are and you plan to get pregnant or are pregnant, you should avoid them at all costs. You just don't want to do that to your baby. Right. There it is. And if you happen to travel anyway, you just need to alert your healthcare provider. Right. Uh, I'm sensing that uh, mosquito repellent is going to fly off the shelves and uh, that the Olympics that are going to be in Brazil might be compromised. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's it, you know, and, they're, and we're going to be starting to kill all sorts of mosquitoes now. I mean, they're going to use insecticides. I hope that we don't cause more problems with the insecticides than we do. It's of considerable interest that the same mosquitoes carry the West Nile virus, which, of course, is throughout the U.S. Right. And so, and dengue also. And so you have dengue, West Nile, and now Zika and another couple of viruses. And so the time is ripe to do something about mosquitoes. Yeah, it is. Uh, th there was something I read about um, where they would have developed a, gr a group of male mosquitoes. They grow male mosquitoes. They don't bite. Male mosquitoes don't bite. It's always the girl, you know. I don't know why that is. Do you? <laughs> so, the, uh, and what they've done is they put into their genes some kind of aberrant uh, change that would make the, the babies of the, of the new mosquitoes uh, die so that it kills off a number of them. And they found some success with that. But then, of course, there's that fear that we're messing with Mother Nature too much. Any comments? 
No, that, that's <laughs> been the, the, the hope about malaria, too, mm -hmm. and has been widely tried about malaria. And probably it's going to end up that a vaccine is the best for both diseases. Yeah. We haven't got a malaria vaccine yet, though, do we? No. I understand that there are several possibilities. Yeah, and this will probably push us to go in the right direction. All right, well, we've got um, a 79-year-old woman from Sioux Center, Iowa. I wake up with painful swollen fingers in the night. Can you explain this? Now, I know that they're one of the most common problems, neurologic problems, uh, that we have out there is peripheral neuropathy. A lot of people have it. I, I care for a lot of people who wake up who have numbness and pain in their hands, numbness and pain in their feet, <clears throat> many of whom are diabetic. Any comments uh, of you, the educator? I know you're not a clinical person, you're an educator, but neuropathy, you have any? Uh... Uh, no. I would direct the, that to clinical personnel. I okay. would say that uh, I would strongly encourage the current students to educate their patients about possible diagnosis and possible diseases. Yeah. But, well, and I always look for a B12 deficiency and thyroid disease and, and probably alcohol and diabetes are the major reasons, though. Ken? But waking up with painful swollen fingers in the middle of the night. What do you think about it? I think about osteoarthritis. And that's the main thing I think about. But as an internal medicine practitioner, a general medicine practitioner, what do you think about it? I also think about rheumatoid arthritis. I, I, I kind of took the opportunity to talk about neuropathy because, you know, we have the neurologist here. But uh, the most common is sometimes they'll sleep on their arms and they'll have painful hands or numb hands. I hear a lot of that. But my guess is both hands, painful hands in the night, I think about rheumatoid arthritis. They wake up in the morning and their hands are so stiff they can hardly move it for more than an hour. That's rheumatoid arthritis. I think about gout. I take care of people who, who have sub, subtle gout, but it's commonly one-sided. Uh, I, I worry about uh, they d did something with their hands, worked their hands too much that day, and then they have painful hands. Any, I'd, I'd, those are the things that come to the top of my head. Any other thoughts? Either? A couple of comments about neuropathy. Uh, the neuropathies that you see in diabetes and alcoholism and many other systemic diseases usually start in the feet first. And so the symptoms are painful soles of the feet and of cramps in the legs and then sl the symptoms slowly make their way upward and so this is the hands are one of the last things that occur with symptoms in the kind of usual peripheral neuropathy that one sees yeah i had a guy yesterday or this week <clears throat> came in though with stocking glove as they say he he, he had numbness in his hands and his feet, it's that stocking glove, both peripheral, uh, and it was a neuropathy, I mean, it was worked up. Um, and I think it was a toxin that, that someone else had defined it. Um, and there's also those heavy metal things. But let's go on. 81-year-old woman from Mitchell, uh, will, will you comment on Bell's palsy and how serious it is and how long it lasts, side effects, and the best treatments? Bell's palsy. Okay. I'll make a few comments. As a generalization, you can divide the patients with Bell's palsy into two big groups, uh, younger people and people who are 60 years or older. The younger people, it is usually due to a virus, a herpes type of virus, and <clears throat> it is severe, it goes away, it often leaves a painful neuropathy in its place. Older people, in addition to having the possibility of it being a virus, vascular problems such as diabetes or collagen vascular disease can cause an infarct of the seventh cranial nerve, and that produces Bell's palsy. And so when you see a patient who's over 50 or 60 with Bell's palsy, you need to carefully work them up for causes other than the virus. 
And <clears throat> most of the time, it slowly goes away. Often, though, it leaves this very painful neuropathy. Um, <clears throat> In any of those, uh, though, uh, it's not going to be, if, if it's one of those other causes besides the virus, it's not necessarily a reversible thing, even if you find it. I mean, you, you right. vascular. Right. It slowly goes away. And it doesn't always leave pain. It's not nearly like shingles, for example, that frequently leaves a very painful neuropathy. And having brought up shingles, uh, Let's every, talk about that a little everybody bit. of the age of 50 or 60 or so should have a shingles vaccine. Have That's you had the, yours? I certainly have. So have I. So the question I would have is, um, you know, people speak about the fact that the after shingles pain syndrome is always or more, much more common in the elderly than it is in the younger person. Speak to that. That's true, and I don't know why that's the case. Of course, older people much more commonly than younger people have shingles. Younger people who have shingles are usually immunocompromised people who have some other illness that predisposes them. Okay. We have an uh, 86-year-old woman. What's the best protocol for 86-year-old who's had previous bowel blockages? you have a comment? My first question is, what is meant by bowel blockage? And I guess that, that means uh, obstruction, bowel small, obstruction. small bowel yeah. obstruction. And I must confess that as a non-surgeon that I don't have an answer. Do, do, Achiko, I'll throw in my answer. Do you have any comment? Um, maybe daily laxatives or things like Miralax. Right. I, I like stool softeners. I like Miralax. Uh, I like uh, uh, starting with low doses of fiber and kind of gradually building them up. Uh, I take care of a bunch of people who have periodic recurrent partial bowel obstructions from previous surgery and then they have adhesions or from an inflammatory process and then they have adhesions uh, and diverticulitis history and then adhesions and so uh, but you have to watch it because when they come in and they're acutely ill and there's there's so much pain that suddenly they can't move then you you need to get them uh, worked on surgically 80 year old woman I, when I eat or drink anything my nose begins to run it continues to run for 15 to 20 minutes after eating what causes this that's a great question Occasionally, people with diabetes will have <clears throat> what is called a gustatory neuropathy. So that when you particularly eat things like pickles, you sweat, and occasionally your nose runs too. And so that's one of the prominent causes. In fact, you can walk into a dining room and tell the people who have diabetes because they're the people who are taking out the handkerchief and constantly wiping Wipe the sweat it, off, sweating off their, their face. face. <laughs> Gustatory neuropathy. That's very interesting. <clears throat> but in many different, in many people like this lady, though, there is no cause that one can the, identify. No, I know of young, healthy, perfectly healthy people whose nose runs when they eat, and uh, particularly pregnant women will do that. But and who knows why? Have you, Achiko, any, any add? Anything you would teach med students about this? No. no. Okay, okay. 51 <laughs> year old woman from Sioux Falls who has leukemia and her mother, and, uh, and his mother, her husband has leukemia. That's it. She, she is 51. Her husband has leukemia. His mother has lymphoma. Should they be worried about their children getting any kind of illness from this? You know, the. I do not know the statistics, and I would not venture an answer. It's certainly true that a lot of different cancers, that there is a slightly increased possibility of children. Uh, but it's a very specific kind of thing, and I would ask their physician. You know, and my answer is, yeah, there is a there is a slight increase, but it sure doesn't commit you to it. I mean, it's sort of like breast cancer, except for this kind of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, that's very strong in families. The rest of it is 
commonly breast cancer happens in people who have no breast cancer. It can happen in, in uh, people who has uh, family history and a slight increased risk. And I think that's what uh, a lot of illnesses are slightly increased, but it doesn't commit you to the illness. I know of someone who's whose mom uh, and her aunts have had uh, Alzheimer's and she's worried that she's going to get Alzheimer's and the answer is yeah there's a higher risk but it's not massive it's not, you're not for sure to have it. Any comment about Alzheimer's Ken? There are some genes that greatly increase the incidence of Alzheimer's that it's possible to identify. Uh, most people prefer not to know that they have those genes. Because there's nothing you're going to be able Because to. there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And so it's not something that most people would pursue. 78-year-old woman from Brookings wondering if there's any remedy for a loud buzzing in the ear. She's been told it was a virus that damaged the nerve. Does she have an option for relief or cure? And so she has tinnitus. A huge, huge number of people over 60 or 70 have tinnitus. The first thing she needs to do is to let her physician look into it carefully to make sure it's not wax right. because that can do tinnitus. Secondly, <clears throat> there are certain tumors that can produce tinnitus and they are very uncommon and it's very unusual. Uh, but that needs to be part of the consideration for anybody who has tinnitus. And then thirdly, you learn to live with it and forget about it. The fact most of the time there are various medications that have been tried, and I'm not sure that they're very helpful. No, I, and the, the, be, the best answer that I've been able to discover is you turn on the radio and you turn the channel to just off of, of uh, a channel so it's a sound so you're not bothered by the noise or uh, and that never works very well or you get wave machine or you turn on a fan in the room or something like that because it, it but it, or just forget about it most of it is because when you hear when you have hearing loss that is related to the nerves uh, you get tinnitus go, that goes with it any disagreement uh, there is, how do we know the difference between arthritis of the neck and a pinched nerve in the neck? Any expertise on that? Um, I would comment it's based on a medical history and this is something that the uh, physicians would make a diagnosis and not the person by himself or herself. Right. You, you can have a, when the nerve is being pinched, everything that that nerve is distributed uh, to, for example, pinch the nerve goes down the arm. Arthritis in the neck doesn't always pinch that nerve, though. So and that, also probably arthritis is, mm, pinched nerve may be more localized than arthritis. is more a generalized diagnosis. We have a vitamin D question um, about D3. 64-year-old man from Alcester currently taking vitamin D3. Is there a difference from a regular vitamin D supplement? And is, when can you take too much, Ken? Uh, I don't have a good answer that I look more to you to answer that well, I, I, I followed this and it's, the, the studies say that if you're under 10,000 you're safe. Vitamin D3 is the kind that is the available that we generally suggest. 2,000 of vitamin D3. When the weather is cold and the roads are icy, it's harder to get to the gym. But luckily, there are a wide variety of effective exercises that you can do in the comfort of your own home. The winter months can be really difficult here in South Dakota to stay active uh, with our cold weather. Um, but one thing that you can do is you can do a lot of fun things outside um, still, even though it's cold, just bundling up and using the right gear. Um, but when it gets slippery out and, and that snow on the ground, it's unsafe to be outside. So there's a lot of great things to do. Uh, you can come in and just have a chair and just do some body weight exercises such as some squats or some lunges, um, some push-ups are some other really great options to do that kind of works the entire body. But really you want to work on your strength, 
your range of motion, and your flexibility. If you're uncomfortable of maybe with your balance, um, a great thing is to just grab a chair, um, hang on to the chair, and just you're gonna lower down, um, just like you are sitting in a chair. And if you want to actually have the chair behind you, so if you do lose your balance, you actually have somewhere to fall on. And that works your hamstrings, your quadriceps, and then your glutes, which is your bottom, which are used every day, getting up, doing all types of things, whether you're getting in and out of your vehicle, so it's a really great exercise there. Also with the lunges, there you can grab a chair, and you're just gonna straddle and have one leg forward and one back, and you're just gonna dip down. And when you do that, you wanna make sure your knee doesn't pass your toe. But you can go as deep as you want, as far down to the floor, whatever's most comfortable for you, and then come back up. Maybe do eight, 12, 15 repetitions, and then switch legs with the other foot forward and repeat those exercises. As we get older, our bone density decreases. So by doing some of these exercises, you're gonna help keep that bone density. Um, and also, just the activities of daily living. You've probably heard that. Um, it's like parking further away at the parking lot um, if you're going shopping and walking in. Um, by keeping up those during the year, it's just gonna be able to do other things more easily, whether it's grocery shopping. Um, once again, getting in and out of the car, people take um, for granted of how much that you twist and turn um, and even if you're grabbing things off the shelf at home, um, carrying in groceries. Um, so it really is important to keep that up during the winter months. It's never too late to start exercising uh, or an exercise program. Um, start off slow. Um, take three to five exercises um, with eight to 15 repetitions and just try it a few times a week. You can start very uh, modified. For example, if you would do a push-up, you can start on your knees or even start on the wall and do some push-ups and work at it. But don't feel discouraged. Um, we all had to start somewhere, so just start somewhere, do a little something, and eventually you're going to get stronger and you're going to feel better and be able to do more things. So eat that yogurt, lady, and also get that exercise. Do you, what do you think about that exercise uh, comment about uh, uh, Ms. Landmark's head? Well, it's uh, very important and uh, we, sh we shall stay active. That will increase our energy and uh, prolong our health. So it's very important. I strongly encourage everybody to exercise. Do you do the same, Dr. Walker? Oh, yeah. I think that regular exercise is an imperative. And I don't think it needs to be a, a gigantic. It can be walking, you know. I, th I had someone trick me, well, it didn't trick me, encourage me to uh, join her group where uh, you threw in 20 bucks and after a year, if you have walked one mile a day, six days out of seven in the week, then you get uh, your money back and split the people who've dropped out or who, who haven't been able to do it, right? So it changed me from a three day a week um, vigorous exerciser to a walk five days a week with a little bit of vigorous exercise thrown in. And it's, it, it's been a wonderful thing. Well, that looks like you might, might be quitting medical practice. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I, I think that the advent of the apps for the phones yes. is going to make a huge difference because there's no question but you can quantitate your exercise with the apps. I had a college professor friend who's been my patient for 15 years, 10 years, and every time I see him, and of course he's in a high stress, you know, one of those leadership roles, uh, he's gaining a little bit more weight, you know, not been able to get to, you got to exercise more, he got, a, he got one of those apps, and he's lost 20 pounds, and he's, you know, it's driving him, he's driven to get that exercise. I think you're exactly right, I think it really makes a difference. So my wife got one of those for, for her Christmas present because she, that's what she asked for and we'll see if it, it helps her. We've got questions. A uh, 60 year old man from Martin, South Dakota, do the experts think there will ever be a vaccine for malaria? That's a good question. Yes, unequivocally, there will be. I do not know 
the stage at which vaccine development for malaria is now. And it may be very far along, but I'm confident. And as you probably know, the Gates Foundation has been spending quite a lot of support for malaria vaccine. Well, in, in a sense, I worry about vaccination availability in this country and others because um, you know, sometimes you have something that pops up and it's an emergency like Ebola. How soon does that vaccination get out? How many hoops do you have to go through to make sure it's safe? And then who's making it and who gets it? And uh, those are, you know, those are very important questions that are left sort of up to the whim of, well, there's got to be some uh, financial encouragement for that kind of thing. Well, uh, we are lucky to have organizations like um, CDC, first of all, exist, and uh, then WHO, and uh, they have proved to be very good and very effective, and eff effective more than efficient, probably, in responding to the outbreaks. Uh, of course, in, as in everything else, there are priorities, and that's why some of the uh, diseases who don't, which don't have that high uh, incidence of outbreaks are pushed back and more important ones and more urgent ones are the uh, ones that the resources are spent on. But uh, we saw the preparedness and response to Ebola uh, by different organizations yeah. and that is encouraging. And so we do now have an Ebola vaccine, right? Um, we we do have a Ebola vaccine that was developed so it, last I, year. Wow! I mean, it came at fast. I don't know the details about it and how it works, but they were they were able to to develop it. You know, fabulous stuff. We're you're both here to speak to the World Health Organization uh, South Dakota uh, uh, effort, uh, and be, and part of what's happened is because you have are starting a medical school with the collaboration of Emory in Georgia, the country, and a lot of what happened is because of what you did, Ken, in in helping that that uh, link between those the state and the country and the U.S. Um, any comment about uh, of this World Health effort that we'll be doing? Something that we have become very interested in as a result of our work is in <clears throat> the stability of developing nations. Uh, political and other stability is very important. Yeah. And <clears throat> the health of various important sectors, such as the healthcare sector, is vital the stability of developing nations. And so something that we think is very important to take up is to take the crucial sectors such as healthcare sector and help developing nations make them strong and that that goes a long way toward a strong nation. Um, and tomorrow the two of you will be speaking in Brookings at the at the student union and it's an it's something we'd love for people to attend. I think we might even have a, it'll be at the end, we'll see it. 61-year-old man from Sioux Falls discuss Ebola. I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about Ebola. It really panicked us all. It was such a devastating illness. Is it completely gone now? Are we still seeing some Ebola? There, I think just in the last week or two, there was another case in Sierra Leone. And so it clearly has not gone, gone away. No, oh, but we have a vaccine, and they're spreading it. Okay. Um, will we? Hopefully, we'll be done with this one if the vaccine is available. 86-year-old woman from Aberdeen talking about swelling in the fingers, now arthritis. How does that compare with the symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome? As a neurologist, carpal tunnel syndrome is what? Uh, it's where there's compression of the nerve as it goes through the carpal tunnel and can be easily re relieved by cutting it, Occasion by relieving the pressure. Occasionally it is seen when there are other illnesses such as endocrine illnesses that make the, uh, the tendon get bigger. And so the 
the symptoms of pain in the hand and fingers, and oft, usually at night is when it's most severe, and radiating from the fingers up to the shoulder, but occasionally you can mistake it from coming from the shoulder down. And it's often both arms at the same time. Right, and, and the first, the thumb, the pointer, the, the middle finger, and sometimes half the fourth finger or, you know, in that distribution. Different from the ulnar nerve neuropathy where it's the, the pinky finger. Right. All right, 68-year-old uh, man from T, currently using pantoprozole, which is the same as omeprazole or Prilosec for acid reflux, but I'm also using hypertension, hypertension and hyperthyroidism, uh, hyperthyroid medications. Does panoprozole affect my other drugs? Either one of you have a good answer to that. I do not think so, but I'm not a pharmacologist. And my answer is not much. And so it, I, you know, you're, you need the thyroid medicine, you want to have your re blood pressure reasonably controlled, and the uh, protonics, or the is the brand name of pentaprozol, uh, is uh, is that. And I, I, as long as you take it an hour or half an hour before you eat, I think we're good. Seventy-seven year old female, several years of repeated repeated bladder infections. What does the panel think about taking uh, vitamin C to increase the acidity of the urine? I'm taking a daily dose of a half of Bactrim uh, once a day. So any comments about? bladder infection, and vitamin C? Do, do not know. I think the infections need to be handled based on the case by the physician in the clinic. Okay. I would say that I like vitamin C as a treatment. I've been successful in nursing home patients who have recurrent infection, recurrent infections, antibiotics, 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 500 cc's of uh, milligrams of vitamin, micrograms of vitamin C four times a day, and it seems to be doing good. It helps pr hold it off. Do you and, know one of the early, earliest advocates of vitamin C? Yeah, the, the guy from California, but I got to go. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. In 2013, worldwide, an estimated 500,000 people died of malaria, mostly children in the African continent. The question, true or false, <coughs> 1,500 cases of malaria diagnosed in the United States? True or false? Answer is true. It was William Acock from Spearfish who answered the question correctly. Thank you, William, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. <coughs> Sorry, flu. You're not you when you have the flu. Get vaccinated, because stopping the flu starts with you. It was in the early 70s and at the end of our second year at USD Medical School. All sophomores left the classroom to spend the last month with a practicing doctor out on the South Dakota prairie. And I was assigned to Madison, South Dakota. There, I heard of a case of meningitis that had happened a few months earlier. The teenage girl came to the emergency room with severe headache, spotty rash, stiff neck, high fever, and confusion. Recognized as possibly meningitis, the wise doctor and the emergency room team quickly performed a lumbar puncture, also called a spinal tap. In addition, blood cultures, IV fluids, and broad-spectrum antibiotics were started within minutes of the patient arriving to the hospital. The shocking nature of this story was that over the ensuing hour, despite all the correct actions taken, the girl died. A day later, cultures of blood and spinal fluid came back positive for Neisseria meningitides, a type of bacteria that can spread in an indiscriminate and epidemic way through communities of healthy young people, such as high school classes, army barracks, and college dormitories. Prior to antibiotics, epidemics of spinal meningitis were merciless. But in 1973, everyone from the girl's family and in the ER who came in contact with her 
were given miraculous antibiotics for a period of time as a preventative measure, and only one more case of meningitis happened in that community that spring. The word meningitis is from the Greek membrane, an itis for inflammation, indicating an irritation of the tough protective membrane that surrounds the brain and spinal canal like a raincoat. Meningitis means an infection has spread involving that membrane, and more important, the spinal fluid within, and generally starts from a nose, lung, or blood infection. There are many different kinds of meningitis infections from bacteria, viruses, fungi, and more, but the diagnosis always requires a lumbar puncture and blood cultures. Historically, the most common bacterial causes for meningitis were from three very aggressive bacterial groups with fancy names, Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitis, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. But things have changed since 1973. Now, in developed countries like ours, another miracle of science called vaccination has greatly reduced, although not completely eradicated, spinal meningitis infection from these deadly bacteria. A recent South Dakota death in a young man from meningitis who had been vaccinated emphasizes the words, reduced, not eradicated. Our story of meningitis clarifies how infections can be so dangerous, how antibiotics and vaccinations have been very effective, and yet how life is so very fragile. A heartfelt thank you to our guests tonight, Ken and Archel. It was wonderful to have you back with us again. You were here, I think, two years ago. The South Dakota World Affairs Council has chosen global health as its annual symposium theme. The symposium began tonight and continues tomorrow morning at the Valstorf Ballroom on the South Dakota State University campus in Brookings. Tomorrow morning, our guests, Ken and, and Echico, We'll begin with a 9 a.m. presentation on the importance of healthcare models in nation building. The entire event will wrap up at 12.30. The symposium is free and open to the public. For additional information about the speakers and their topics, visit their website, SouthDakotaWorldAffairsCouncil.org, or call 605-691-2687. Now on to our flu season update. We're still doing better than we were last year at this time, but we're not out of the woods yet. In previous years, when we started out with a few cases, the peaks still went on very high, though they were delayed to March or even April. So don't delay, get your flu vaccine now, reduce your chances of catching the flu bug. That does it for tonight from all of us here and on call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. tasks as basic as picking up a cup and taking a sip of coffee. That is, until something stops us. Hand and elbow injuries. Next time, on call with the Prairie Doc. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Better Care Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by the Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. Avera Heart Hospital, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, 
Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, South Dakota State Medical Association, Swift Telecommunications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for on call with Prairie Dykes is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.